Hey everybody, I'm back and we're looking at more games for October. Still got a ton. A couple of these are ending pretty quickly. A lot of innovation going on for October and just keep in mind towards the end of the month and into the beginning of November there's going to be a lot of big campaigns popping through as well. So uh, manage your money, but there's some good stuff in here. You're probably going to hear my laser engraver going on in the background. And speaking of lasers and colors, we've got this 16 LED mood altering dice tray. The mood doesn't change according to or the the lighting doesn't change according to your mood it's just that you can set the uh, the remote to whatever you want for the colors uh, this is pretty uh, common LED uh, stuff at this point you buy strips of these and they're fairly cheap uh, I'm not sure if this is uh, all battery operated I believe it is um, and you can probably set on the controller uh, blinking or different colors or whatever it is that you want to do um, it's kind of neat. Uh, I have uh, different colored lights and they actually use this exact same remote uh, for the room, sitting behind the TV and uh, in the closet area I put in some lights and they're kind of nice to have around. This will change the, the mood uh, or the, the, the colors at least of the room that you're in if you're playing RPGs or whatever. Maybe you want to accentuate a fireball or something else. It's kind of neat. You're going to probably need to contact them for uh, pre-order as it is ending very quickly. Then we have the little brother of the uh, really nice boxes we were looking at last week. These are Spellbook Minis. They can hold some dice. They've got a little bit of foam tray. They can hold a single uh, mini. So maybe if you had one or two of these uh, to hold on to your characters when you went to uh, take it to the game, that would make it neat for uh, your DM because then you have your own little dice tray and you have your own set of dice, and you got your mini all set and ready to go for your character. Uh, that would just help with a lot of the organization. It's a nice idea. It'd be great if everyone in your campaign could do it. They have made $144,000. Uh, they are doing pretty well on these things, so a lot of people are also jumping in, at least 2,000 of them. So uh, this is a very, very popular campaign. We're gonna see some other campaigns that are doing just as well. This is a very good time if you're an RPG player to pick up some nice swag. Then we have a new faction for Alchemy. These are the Rados Cults. And Alchemy is not necessarily a game where you're out there just to kill the other side. There is some type of objective that you're working towards with six to 10 minis and uh, it is fantasy themed. It seems to take place in the desert area. They have some different terrain. It looks like old Assyrian and Egyptian and other pieces. Uh, none of these come painted, but uh, it just looked like it would be better to show you uh, the idea of what they look like painted so that uh, maybe you would pick these up for a different game. Even if you didn't play Alchemy, you could still uh, grab these. One of the things that they're doing is uh, offering fast shipping to the first 80 people and there's still uh, time. It is funded, uh, but you can jump in on that fast shipping still if this is something that you'd be interested in. And uh, if you need some more cultists or whatever for your uh, RPG campaigns or other skirmish games. Then we have another really neat thing. These are foam pieces of terrain. And uh, the foam is nice because it is harder to damage. It's not brittle because it just kind of bends and folds and whatever the case is. But uh, it does chip, so uh, if you cut into it or anything like that, uh, it could flake off. And at a certain point, the uh, moisture in it will uh, fall apart. So in 10, 20 years or whatever, it may start to disintegrate. Uh, but it's cheap, which is nice to have. Um, these look very neat um, because the foam kind of takes on the details of whatever uh, mold that you throw it in and uh, that may make it easier also to store so you don't have to necessarily worry too much about it if you just kind of like throw it in the corner um, because it's not brittle and it won't break. Uh, take a look at all the different building options. They have lots of different ones. Being lightweight and all that kind of cool stuff uh, makes it ideal for a lot of different tables um, and uh, the detail that they got on it, especially for the stonework and other pieces, is pretty amazing and uh, it's a lot easier to print to paint than the things you would 3d print just because of uh, the way that it would hold on to paint and uh, primer without the uh, the scan lines uh, not scan lines print lines in between uh, on uh, other systems then we are getting into christmas time because we need that lead up uh, this is the lovecraft country holiday collection these are by golden goblin i have a couple of their books the books are actually pretty good 
mainly for Call of Cthulhu, as you can see there in the corner. I, I guess I could crop that off, but mainly it's more important to see the picture, so we'll go with that. Anyway, uh, they uh, they have neat adventures. They're not huge. Um, they're not going to go like a billion years, uh, so you have to be a greater uh, or old one in order to uh, to con complete anything. You can complete it in a couple of sessions, and they've been uh, very inventive so far in the stuff that I've read. Uh, they did a lot of things winter-based already uh, on the campaigns that I picked up, some uh, winter hobos and uh, an old shack in the woods with uh, a wendigo. Uh, lots of neat stuff, and the writing is pretty solid. So if you are looking for something for Call of Thulu, or you want something in that 1920s era, uh, or just Christmas-themed for uh, playing with your family members or whatever for the holidays, then uh, give Golden Goblin Press a quick look. Uh, they do print on demand, so they should be able to, to deliver fairly quickly and uh, have it out to you by the holiday. Then we have Roan World at War. Uh, I don't know if this is like a brony thing, or what the idea is, it's some type of horse people. Um, yeah, it's diesel punk version, uh, including some levels of magic uh, into the Roan RPG. It says it's platoon scale ex uh, expansion. I don't understand <laughs> what's going on or what this is all for. I don't know how you hold a gun with hooves. It's it's it is what it is. Um, my Little Pony kind of blew past me. I was on Ninja Turtles and G.I. Joe when that was out, so uh, I have no idea what people are, are interested in for this stuff. The uh, the pencil work on the right, though, it looks pretty cool. They got a lot of expression in there, um, so I guess if you're into this kind of thing, then uh, this would be a fun way to go if you want to have a big war. Then also from the 80s, we have Rental Rumble. This is a game that's supposed to be uh, like the nostalgia of going to the video rental store. Uh, it looks like maybe you're walking around the neighborhood or maybe you're stuck in an old movie. It's hard to tell because they're, uh, they're more about, oh, look, it's in a VHS case. And uh, they're wanting it to be more about the theme than the game itself. Uh, so that's what's lacking a little bit from the campaign. I hope the game's still good. The thing is, it's cheap though. Even if it's not, it's 30 bucks, uh, and you can get all these different uh, expansion cards. Yes, a lot of us are on the older side, and yes, a lot of us remember going to uh, the neighborhood uh, before DVD, going to the neighborhood rental place and getting whatever crappy movie for a dollar. And then Blockbuster comes in, and then everybody charges five dollars to rent it. It's like, nah, man. But then a lot of people don't remember about having to rewind and getting late fees if you didn't have it in by 10 a.m. or whatever the case is the next day. Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe you don't want to relive this, but eh, who knows? Maybe you do. Uh, it does look pretty much like it fits all in that uh, VHS case. So uh, if you want to sit around with your friends in their uh, late 30s, early 40s, uh, or later, then uh, maybe do this. Otherwise, just watch the DVD, man. Come on. The quality is so much better. Blu-ray. Four times better. Even more. 4K. 16 times better. Come on. I may be biased just because my day job is working on uh, optical and VOD media. And I'm going to tell you, 4K is awesome, especially if you get Dolby Vision or HDR Plus on your TV. Yeah, watch The Shining. It, it'll look amazing. Uh, Skull Duggery is the next one up. This is by White Flag Games. And I like the idea of you're stealing from other thieves. So it's like you're going down to a dragon horde and uh, trying to steal everything from the dragon, but someone else is there! And that means you have to have at least three players. Wonk, wonk for me, but maybe not for you. Uh, the art looks pretty good, it's all fantasy themed, and uh, you're just uh, taking gems from each other and uh, screwing each other over, and that's always a lot of fun. It says ages eight and up, just make sure the kid can understand the rules and uh, doesn't throw a fit when you steal from him, and I think you'll be just fine. Then we have Slice. I did not get lazy on the graphics. They did. This is a guy named Matt who uh, tried to make a simple RPG for his daughter just using dice. And he says there's one page, but where is it? Prove it. Uh, they've already funded for 100 people, probably because there's a lot of people out there that want to play with their kids. Uh, but uh, they need to show some stuff on their page if they want to be uh, you know, really helpful to people be really helpful even in the campaign and show off what it is that uh, makes your your thing so special. I don't know that I'd necessarily trust it. If, you know, just being cheap might be fine, 
uh, that part is up to you. But uh, right now I just see a bunch of dice other people made, and that's not really showing me much in the way of what this game is. Taking the opposite approach is WoW Urban Warfare 3D. These are more printable stuff that you can uh, make for various uh, types of World War II buildings. You don't necessarily have to use it just for World War II. Let's say you wanted to have an Ace Chemicals plant for Batman uh, Miniatures Game or Gotham City Chronicles. Uh, that's what all this uh, piping and everything else could easily be worked towards. Um, the buildings, you can get them put together, you can get them bombed out. Uh, they seem to work for both and you can print both at the same scale so if you did bomb a building you could swap it out for uh, the pristine one for one of the bombed out ones cool stuff going on uh, I would recommend uh, just about any 3d printer that has enough build space uh, a lot of them you'd want to check and uh, just see how high you can really get uh, your print to go that's one of the things about having the chimneys and things is it could get higher very easily than uh, what you uh, what your build space is set at, and uh, just when you print things out like this, uh, you really want to have your print line set in a way that uh, they'll be the least noticeable. So uh, something that already has the vertical lines on it, like the one in the middle. Sorry, horizontal lines like the one in the middle. That's the orientation that you'd use uh, for that kind of thing. Just keep in mind if you do uh, print these things off with the um, chimneys it's easier if you print them off on their side because otherwise they'll just snap off because that's the way the print runs then we have critical dice and these are ways to change up what a critical hit would do um, so I guess you, you kind of decide what it is what it's gonna be maybe some of these are like slow uh, kill or poison or do other crazy things maybe stun for a round uh, lots of different options if you just need to change things up on the games that you're playing and you want something random to happen Here you go. There's some options different colors different dice different uh, things to go uh, Maybe you want to do it for wild magic and you don't want to just use the wild magic table. You want something a little more uh, Graphical to occur then uh, these are all options that uh, you can choose. Uh, I don't think that they're tied to any particular game uh, so you'll just have to take a quick look and see if it will work for what you like to play. Then we have another interesting experience. This is Disposable Heroes. This is set in the future, has some fantasy elements, but the main part is it is card-based, and every time a hero dies, you just pick up a new card. So the idea being that uh, somehow in the story, you're supposed to have all these extra people, and uh, you just throw them away. They don't have a lot of hit points or whatever. They're intended to constantly die. And uh, you're still supposed to make it through the mission using uh, all the various card abilities. So it's it's an interesting concept. Um, I, it, it's hard for a lot of people to give up on their characters. They feel like the, the a friend is dying as part of their uh, experience when they get rid of uh, something. So maybe this is a good way to get over that or... Uh, to just challenge yourself into uh, not getting so connected with the character that you lose track of the story. Um, you'll have to look into it and see if it's uh, good for you. The art style doesn't work for me necessarily. I don't like the, uh, the blank spaces of purple on the back. Um, I like a little bit more thrown into it, especially if you're just going to keep throwing them away, which means you're not going to develop them. They're going to be made from the card itself. So, uh, But the artwork that's shown there in the center, it looks passable. Uh, it's just the stuff on the cards themselves may not be 100% uh, what you're looking for. Then we have What the Woof. This is a dog game for card people. So the concept is you are a dog on a walk, and the more things you pee on is the more territory you mark, and that gives you points. So if you've ever had to walk a dog, then you know what this is like, and hopefully you've uh, walked them a good amount so they're nice, healthy dogs. Uh, you can disrupt people's attempts to become the alpha by peeing on everything, by putting uh, other cards in play to distract them. And, uh, you know, it's, it seems funny. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, it'd be good to play with the kids as well. And they could get the idea of uh, how to take care for, uh, of an animal instead of, uh, you know, whatever video game, whatever they're playing. Um, maybe uh, just connecting it to this type of uh, fun experience will uh, make them a little bit more responsible. That's what makes me think of. Or you just love dogs, and you just want to play and uh, continue to love dogs. Here's a game for you. 
Speaking of responsibility, that's forward thinking. How about having a bunker for the apocalypse? That's what this 3D printable terrain is. If uh, you have a campaign setting, let's say you're looking at something like Fallout, and uh, you're going to go vault hunting or whatever the case is, then uh, you might want to have an apocalypse bunker. And there's lots of different options available for you. There's some underground ones, there's walls, there's various things uh, that could all be very useful in uh, whatever RPG or skirmish game or war game that you're going to play. It all looks pretty cool. Uh, 3D printing uh, as well on this. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say probably not on the resins because they're probably too big for resins, but on an FDM printer down to a 0.1 millimeter uh, uh, layer height is probably okay. And then how many people do you know with a good sense of humor? That's what Burning Bridges is all about. You need at least five players. Uh, so if you have a party game of up to 12 people, that's what this is for. You ask questions that, uh, you know, maybe should be very adult. Uh, as you can read on these questions, they're not things that you would typically bring up on a dinner kind of thing, but uh, maybe if you have a crowd that likes to play cards against humanity and gets the more uh, risque expansions then that's who this group is for um, you can uh, scan the QR code if you desire and you'll be able to see some example questions and uh, yeah I mean it seems neat but you really got to know the people that you're with or just flat not care what they say about you you got to have a good sense of humor I think in order to be able to take the hit then for younger people, we have Dance Card. This is a game that can be played lots of different ways. And just like dancing, you can dance like no one's watching and you can play like no one's watching because it offers a solo mode, which is nice. This is a strategy game where you're just out there playing or dancing on uh, a high school uh, dance floor. Uh, lots of different options. The art fits the, the theme very well. They use standees so the game stays uh, fairly cheap. They have funded. And uh, if this is something that uh, I guess maybe like a like a 10 or 11 year old would probably be the youngest because just before they go into school dances would be the best time to uh, to try to uh, to play this game I think so yeah if you want to play this with your kids there you go or maybe you've just never left high school in which case grow up stop looking at these games then we have one of the games in the Time of Legends franchise. This one is done by Mythic, Joan of Arc. This is a 1.5 upgrade version, so you can still get all of the original uh, stuff that was on the first Joan of Arc campaign, uh, Kickstarter campaign. And uh, Mythic, they do a lot of cool stuff. They make a lot of neat games. This is a two to four player game of combat between different medieval factions. There is uh, dragons and other crazy stuff, uh, so it does have a lot of those fantasy elements also involved with it. Um, I believe Mythic is the one that was talking about how when you have big games like this, it's really hard to go retail to get their uh, margins, and it just makes more sense for them to be a Kickstarter-only brand for some uh, of the games. That's uh, basically what's going on here. I'm sure Joan of Arc will continue to come out and have reissues and various things. Um, happen with the, the brand and the franchise. The minis do look really cool. They are at a smaller scale than uh, regular 28 millimeters, so don't expect necessarily that to happen. But what that allows you to have is a bigger scale between the, uh, the dragons and the regular units, and you can get a lot more terrain. They have churches and other stuff on there as well. So uh, yeah, take a quick look at this and see if it's for you. Beasts of War has a lot of really good uh, videos playing through Joan of Arc. And we have a very different game. This is Upstairs Downstairs Expansion for Obsession. And uh, this is like a Victorian era. I'm going to guess it's like for the Downton Abbey fan. Um, it seems to be about society. Uh, I haven't played through any of it. And uh, it seems to be an, ec an economic simulation in uh, that Victorian uh, era of Europe. Um, I guess the original sold out. They've cleared 1,500 backers, uh, well over $100,000. So obviously there's some people that uh, were waiting for this expansion or really wanted to pick up the original game. So take a quick look at it. It's not necessarily for me um, because it, I like Downton Abbey, I have no, no nothing makes me want to watch that show. Um, but uh, 
or the movie. But that movie made a ton of money uh, out of nowhere at you know, the recent box office. So maybe uh, you've got a fan in, in your household or uh, this is something that you could play for Easter or whatever if you have a bunch of people over and uh, you want to play a game and not necessarily want to talk about elections or other crazy stuff, which is why I play games, because I don't want to talk about those things. I want to still enjoy and like my friends and not have to hear about their thoughts. And one of the best games for that was uh, Chronicles of Crime. I didn't have to hear about my friends or any of their ideas because we were too busy playing it, and that was made by Lucky Duck Games, who's also making this second Time of Legends game that ends exactly at the same time as the Joan of Arc one. This is an app-driven uh, RPG game um, that has a narrative and everything. And uh, Lucky Duck are very good at making things integrate with the app in an interesting way that uh, seems organic and makes the story go forward. Uh, on the uh, Chronicles of Crime stuff, the um, scenario creator and all that has uh, finally come out. And they've got some uh, interesting missions and they've done a lot to support that. So uh, I'm guessing that they're going to do the same here. Um, it's probably bad timing that they, they go together. Maybe the two campaigns should be linked in some way. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're a fan of Time of Legends and uh, Joan of Arc and you just don't need a big part of the 1.5 campaign, you don't need a whole new game, but you want something else, then maybe that's a good idea that this one's occurring at the same time. We'll see. It's making half a million dollars and over 6,000 backers, so I'm sure it's doing fine. But uh, Lucky Duck is a good studio. If you follow them, though, they follow every campaign. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you'll find out about all kinds of cool stuff because they buy so much from other people. Then on a cuter aspect, we have Unicorn Fever from the people that made Potion Explosion. You have lots of different types of uh, unicorns, and they are racing down the rainbow to steal a leprechaun's pot of gold. And you uh, do what you can to uh, mess with each other and uh, get to the end of that rainbow as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, the components and all that look pretty neat. The art style is uh, pretty... Uh, it's unique in that it both works on the 2D side and the 3D side, keeping the same character. Um, you know, the not necessarily the, the, the mini type character, but the, the, the essence of a character is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so it's fun on both uh, 3D and 2D uh, viewings. Uh, I, uh, I think it looks pretty neat, except that you're going to need at least three players. So keep that in mind. It's not really a solo game. And uh, but yeah, there's uh, it looks like it will be fun for all ages. Um, and, uh, you know, the humor will come through uh, to various uh, age groups, depending on uh, on which parts you look at, but it looks like kind of like a Pixar movie. There's there's something in there for, for everybody to pick up on. Then not so much for all age groups. We have Deviant the Renegades. This is a tabletop RPG by one of the guys that uh, started uh, Werewolf Magazine, I think for White Wolf or White Wolf Magazine. Uh, he did a bunch of uh, art and different things for uh, World of Darkness. And uh, that's what you can see here. It looks very reminiscent. Um, if uh, you are part of uh, the Chronicles of Darkness, if you're uh, a player of that uh, type of game, or uh, you just like the old school versions of the old World of Darkness, then uh, Deviant may be a game for you as it does incorporate uh, a lot of those mystical elements. Um, it incorporates his art style um, that made a lot of uh, those early books very interesting. So. I would say take a quick look at it if you were a fan of the old uh, old way of going about things. There's about 1,400 other people that have also backed it, so uh, it does have uh, some customers and, and other people out there. Hopefully it'll have some legs and continue to come out with more uh, interesting, cool stuff. It has its own take on that whole uh, genre, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth a look if you like Richard Thomas's work from, uh, from the previous stuff uh, that he did for White Wolf. This appears to be under his own banner though, um, but uh, yeah, it just has that same kind of feel. Then a little bit out of place, but belongs here anyway. The 3D printable spooky desktop tabletop miniatures by Mia K. Um, the, uh, if you're gonna play Deviant, you might need some spooky stuff. If you just want something for uh, Halloween, there's witches and ghosts and uh, tombstones and grim reapers and all that cool stuff uh, going on here. Uh, she bet she met her goal. That's not a problem. Um, but uh, I would suggest because there's a lot of minis, there's a lot of detail going on. 
this would be one of those things where a resin printer would be a good idea. Uh, you might have to scale up a little bit. Uh, there's, since there is so much detail, just make sure that you have uh, your 3D printer in uh, really good uh, calibration uh, before uh, starting on any of these. There's fingers and other uh, thin pieces that uh, PLA can have a hard time with. So just keep that in mind. Uh, take a look at the detail before, uh, before you pick it up and make sure your printer can run it. People run Kickstarters for a lot of different types of dice, and it's rare that you find one that hits all the spots. This uh, damaged dice is amazing. It is separated out by color and uh, has little icons. So if you add 1d6 fire damage or 3d4 necrotic damage or whatever the case is, then uh, you'll know where that damage is coming from because you'll be rolling a specific die for that and it helps to uh, feel a little more thematic and like you're cast and then you throw and it has the the black die or the white die for radiant damage for your paladin smite or whatever the case is um, and the font is easily readable that's another thing so they took the time and they made it so you can read the dice and at the same time feel thematic when you have them it's not often that you see a dice project make over a hundred thousand dollars but here's one that absolutely deserves it. And uh, also coming in the little uh, dice bags helps you find them uh, so that you have them available. And it's almost like you're pulling it out of your little uh, uh, reliquary or, or uh, you know, potion bag or shaman bag, or whatever the crazy thing that you have. So uh, it just feels good when you uh, play with uh, something that's so well designed. It's, it's just something like this is amazing to have. And I hope you jump on it while there's time. And there we have Heart, which is an interesting uh, kind of a steampunk fantasy mix RPG where you're going into basically the center of the earth, maybe. Um, you're digging underneath a city uh, looking for magics and other things. And above that city is a spire. So it looks like there's some like class systems involved and uh, the artwork is pretty neat. Lots of uh, steam and smoke. Um, along with uh, whatever treasures and other crazy things that you find beneath. If nothing else, it's got to be an interesting uh, fantasy um, campaign and story at the, at the minimum, something that's pretty cool to check out. So yeah, if you're looking for something absolutely new in a, a very different uh, kind of world, then uh, look into Heart. Then we have more dog games. Usually there's a lot of cat games on these uh, Kickstarters, but I guess in October it's all about the dogs which I like better anyway. Uh, Knights of the Hound Table is a two-player game where you uh, draft cards, and uh, these cards represent various factions. They're all dog-themed, and uh, use them com to combat each other. Pretty simple um, if you're a dog lover and uh, you want to play against other dog lovers in a medieval world card game that runs pretty quickly, then uh, this might be uh, something of interest for you. Then if you're one of those camping kind of families or you've got kids in a, a scout uh, thing, then uh, Camp Pine Top might be uh, something for you and your family. This is one of those wholesome type of games that simulates the idea of going to a summer camp when you're not being murdered by uh, crazy people that jump out in the woods. Instead, it is the much more realistic version of you just go out and uh, learn new skills and get bit by mosquitoes type of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all it is. You're, you're basically a scout simulator in the sense that you go and you earn badges and then you can upgrade those badges and that's what gives you points. Uh, so if you're looking for something, uh, for next summer or beforehand to get excited about, um, scouting or that kind of thing, I never got to do any of that cause I'm here in the middle of the city and, uh, they just, for some reason, didn't let us into, uh, the, the scouts, even though, uh, we tried one year and then it just kind of disappeared. Budget cuts. That's what happens when you, uh, when you grow up in the eighties, I guess. And then instead of playing around in the day, you can play around at night. This is moon flight, the deck unbuilder. And basically it is a deck of cards and some tokens, but here's some interesting gameplay. You, uh, you play through like you normally would with your, your hand, uh, and then at a certain point, the nighttime is going to pop up, and uh, all the cards flip over, and you use a different side. So you have uh, basically a way to manipulate the cards 
uh, later on in your trash pile in addition to out of your hand putting them into play. Um, the artwork that you see there up uh, upper right hand corner like a dark fantasy uh, carriage ride that's not anywhere in the game itself but just something they kind of threw in. There's no art from what I can tell on the cards themselves and instead they focus mainly on the gameplay side. That's not the worst thing in the world for a little tiny game that's supposed to play in 45 minutes and you can uh, play solo. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I would like to see some more uh, artwork thrown in. Um, the monochromatic thing is neat for some stuff, but uh, yeah, I just uh, I hope the game's great, but maybe it's something that you could just print off uh, and get that version as opposed to just paying for uh, the tarot size and all the other stuff. Yeah, something to think about. Uh, maybe ask them about if there's other versions uh, coming up. If maybe the art will work its way in in a second edition. Then we have a game that is a galactic market for wildlife, Xenofera. Uh, basically, you have all these alien creatures, and for some reason, everyone is trying to buy them. Uh, there's no solo mode, so kind of out with that. I'm not really into the idea of buying living things. So for me, it's, it's two reasons why I wouldn't play it. Um, but it did do well at the Stonemeyer Design Days 2017 takes a while to get artwork and things like that made so you know that's what shows the two years of difference um but if people were having fun with it great um just for me it's like eh, maybe maybe theme wise i uh, wouldn't like it so much i did like a game called startopia that was a video game uh that came out a while back and you had to entice uh people in and uh spore was another video game where you had like alien life and did uh different stuff and those are all fun, and maybe that's part of the same theme. But uh, yeah, it's up to you if you want a market game for buying animals. That is just totally your choice. If it was like a cattle auction, it might make more sense to me, but eh, who knows. This is something that totally makes sense. This is Carbon City Zero. This is a card game of people doing uh, various things to try to get their city to Carbon Zero as quickly as possible. So uh, not only is this you know, a neat little game, that's just a neat little game, but it can show people just a couple of the ideas of things that uh, are in place right now to get to that goal of uh, eventually being carbon zero or negative. That could be uh, a possibility also, depending on uh, how good we are at catalysts and other uh, various devices as technology uh, has that exponential increase forward and uh, those economic drivers push for that level of innovation. So uh, yeah, why not think about that now, especially when uh, the jobs of the future are all gonna be pushing towards that $27 trillion of uh, green energy that's uh, needed. So uh, yeah, why not start thinking about it with your kids, teach them a little bit about uh, p things people are doing to help with climate change and they won't feel the need to uh, you know, sail a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. But, you know, do that too. Whatever, you know, works for you if you got the cash. Then we have Catacombs Cubes. This is a relaunch. Uh, it is an interesting concept because you roll dice or pick tiles and that's how you draft your resources. And then you're given a card and you have to build the shape on the card using the cubes you have available. So, uh, yeah, they look like Tetris pieces or whatever, but you have to build a specific 3D shape to go along with it in order for you to have that building in your uh, your group and get points for it. So there's some problem solving uh, in multiple different ways because there's all these different shapes of cubes. You're not really sure which resources you're gonna get, so you're gonna have to uh, strategize of what uh, is more valuable or less valuable to build. And uh, I like those concepts, uh, spatial organization and uh, management and all this other stuff is, uh, is a great thing to uh, try to you know make the brain do some work so uh, this is a relaunch. I'm not sure if uh, what the case was on the original uh, run through, but they've more than doubled their uh, um, their goal this time. So that part is great. Everything's in Canadian dollars. So that means your money will go a little further unless you're in Canada. Then it'll be the same. Uh, but yeah, think about that. It seems like an interesting game. There was a Tetris game last week. And uh, this one just seems to push that idea even further to uh, actually building instead of just... Uh, uh, trying to get the, the shapes to pop out. So, uh, yeah, something else to think about. Then we have Godspeed. This is a game about an alternate space race where instead of going to the moon, they somehow opened a wormhole to another planet. Uh, so, yeah, there's uh, 
relics and various artifacts and things to grab up. Um, and you still use the same type of 1960s rovers technologies and, and spacesuits and, you know, it's kind of neat, uh, different pieces. Uh, very simple in the art. Um, it doesn't necessarily feel 1960s specifically with the art, but there's nothing wrong with that. It still looks okay. It's very clean in the interface. It looks more like an app put on paper than anything else. Um, but you're going to be racing for whatever faction uh, you uh, are on the side of in order to get whatever crazy stuff is on this planet. So uh, if you're looking for something that uh, maybe fits into the conspiracy theorist on your, uh, on your family, then maybe uh, this will shut them up. But probably it'll just encourage them. So uh, maybe think about it twice. Um, but anyway, yeah, it'll give you something to play through and you can compete. Uh, for whatever faction uh, you identify with, Russian, American, whoever. Then we have the game, or RPG, that has the most interesting name of the week, Under Hollow Hills. This is about circus performers, so if you think of the Hollow Hill as being the circus tent. And this is for uh, the fairy folk and the other fantasy realms alike, and somehow you're running your, uh, your circus. The system they're using is powered by the Apocalypse, um, so there's lots of different options available for you uh, if you're playing already in that system. And uh, yeah, it just seems interesting, a uh, different approach, uh, rather than just running to the mountain to uh, kill the dragon or whatever the case is, that you're actually having to run some level of an economy uh, at the same time with this traveling circus and having different options and other problems that go along with it. A uh, great book about a traveling circus is Johannes Cabal Necromancer, uh, and he had a circus that was uh, created by the devil that he used to capture souls, and it would go on this traveling train. You could have something just as interesting with uh, this type of story. Uh, it just depends on what it is, uh, you know, that you're you're looking for in your game. There's lots of different options and uh, other crazy stuff because it's based on a, an existing system. Then we have a regular game that uh, doesn't get a whole lot of attention in this part of the world, the United States. That's rugby. Uh, I think soccer, which also doesn't get much attention, is bigger. Um, but uh, yeah, we did this Clint Eastwood movie about Nelson Mandela and the Springboks. Uh, they did some change up with the end of apartheid. Uh, it's the only real uh, rugby anything I've had any uh, experience with. So I'm not sure if uh, these characters are uh, or teams are legitimate and used on the characters that are actually or the people that are really playing the game or, or what the case is. But uh, if you, this is a game that you play with your buddies, uh, rugby, and uh, it's too cold and rainy outside or whatever the case is, and uh, or you're too injured to do a scrum, then uh, maybe rugby the game as a card game is better for you. Also. It could be used to help teach the game to other people before you go out there in the field and play, or just to strategize uh, various things. Um, I don't know if there's a, a, like code words or whatever the case is. Um, you know, just trying to train somebody to how to do it. It's a simple game. Doesn't seem to have a, a lot of uh, crazy components to it, so uh, that's why it uh, you know it, it's it's not going to cost you too much to be able to just pick up and and learn how to play it. Then we have a strategy game, Ruins of Mars. Uh, this seems like it was the original mission before all of the craziness in Doom happened. Uh, that's what it seems like to me. You're going out on a rover, and you're trying to collect various uh, Martian artifacts uh, from a previous culture, and um, depending on what you do, the, uh, the actions you can do on the next turn are constantly going to be able to change. So um, you're going to have uh, a lot of different types of resources uh, managed not just on the turn you're on but on the future turns as well um, and you're competing against two to four other players so yeah you're really gonna have to uh, to try to chess it out and figure out what's going on uh, this is not like uh, a Mark Watney situation um, uh, maybe it is though because you're going out in a rover all the time uh, and uh, trying to acquire stuff and he had to acquire all those bits and pieces while he was out there stuck. I don't know, maybe I'm just uh, remembering all the Matt Damon movies. One thing Matt Damon didn't play though is a halfling, and uh, especially not one riding around on a chicken. 
I think you'd have to be smaller than a halfling, or you'd have to get a really big chicken uh, to uh, run around, though. Uh, maybe this is like a Final Fantasy situation. Whatever the case is, Peter Brown has a bunch of different types of halflings. They're not all riding chickens. I just wanted to throw the, those images up because uh, those were the most unique ones. And uh, yeah, if uh, you're looking to add more halflings to whatever game that you're playing, if it's RPG, skirmish, uh, war game, whatever the case is, then uh, here are some options. Or if you just like throwing these things out on, uh, on your shelf. And that's it for this week. Uh, we'll try to get through another round. We're getting close to the end for October, even though it's only the first weekend. So at least you'll have some lead time before uh, the big guys like Zombicide 2.0, Dawn of Madness, and Hour of Need all pop in. Hour of Need might not be a big one for you, but it's a big one for me because it's a blacklist game. And uh, those guys uh, are really awesome. So if you have any comments, questions, concerns, want to tell me what you're going to be for Halloween or anything else, Go ahead and throw those in. If you want to suggest a game, go ahead and do that. Try to make it a game that's not yours or get somebody else to nominate it for you because that's how you know if you're ready uh, to be up there on Kickstarter is people are excited. And if they're excited enough to throw in a comment about a future game, then uh, I'll be sure to be on the lookout for it. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a safe, good time. Looks like the fall weather is starting to kick in. I'm enjoying the cooler nights, waking up and actually having to use a blanket, which hasn't happened in like six months because it's been so warm here in Los Angeles. I hope you guys have a good one.